Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, March 16th, and we are picking up in verse 16. That's easy to remember. We'll back up to Genesis 3.15 just real quickly. We're not going through the detail of it because we spent really almost an entire class on it last week, but we know this is the great first promise of the Redeemer who would come. It's a wonderful prophecy to, to grab hold of and to realize God gave it so early in the program. We're only in chapter 3 in his entire book, and we know that we're, we're not even to the point of Adam and Eve leaving the garden yet when this promise has come to them. Most importantly, before he let them know the results of their sin, the curse that would come on the entire world, the fivefold, and we'll talk about that fivefold course in a moment, but before that, he gave this precious promise. He did not give it before he brought judgment on the serpent, but he did before the rest. And that, that's our God who is long-suffering. That's our God who is faithful when we are not. That's our God who knew that the consequence had to come, that he had already planned the way of redemption. Isn't he amazing? Isn't he wonderful? The one thing that I wanted to bring out is and I, I <coughs> tantalized you last week, how does a serpent in a way represent the Lord when we see him only as Satan and the evil? What I want to take you to is Numbers 21 because this ties in with our prophecy in Genesis 3.15. Numbers 21 was a time in Israel's history. <laughs> oh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but uh, I will say it. We can all learn lessons from Scripture, can we not? Where are we going? Numbers, Benedict Bar Numbers. Oh. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, okay. Numbers. Our fourth book, chapter 21, verses 5 through 9. What has been happening is the children of Israel have been griping and complaining. That's why I said, hmm, maybe we better watch what we're saying. <laughs> the yuck and yuck and yuck can constantly, continually... They were so ungrateful when God was taking care of them and had miraculously provided for them, and they were becoming disobedient to, to what he was telling them to do. And finally, God sent on them a judgment. And that's what we're going to be reading here. Verse 5 says, The people spoke against God, against Elohim, and against Moshe, Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? To die in the wilderness? Hello, you really think God brought them out from under the Egyptians who were making them slaves and killing them, crossed them through the Red Sea safely, drowned the Egyptian army in them, has gotten them into this area now on their way to the promised land, has been feeding them. He's mm -hmm. taking care of everything. He's been giving them water. And when you know this is like two and a half million people, that's no small task to have enough water, to have enough food, God's been taking care of everything, and yet they complain, complain, complain. Has he brought us out here to die? For there's no food, and there's no water, water and we loathe this miserable food. What they're loathing is the man, the manna that has come from heaven. They're complaining about it. They should have appreciated it. They said everything they needed for sustenance. <laughs> Maybe they needed to learn how to make manicotti out of it or something else. <laughs> but they should have appreciated it. And the fact that they were low on water at this point, when they needed water before, God brought water out of the rock. What's their problem? They should simply be turning to him and saying, Lord, this is our need. Please provide. But they didn't, and they complained to the point and, and turned their back on God and all that finally, verse 6, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. They were judged by death. So the people came, the ones who were alive, not the ones who died, obviously, came to Moses, to Moshe, and said, we have sinned. They're beginning to wake up. They're watching their comrades fall, you know, being bitten, and they're realizing, Whoa, you know, we're out of line with our God. If we don't want to be like them, we better get right with God. So they came and said, we've sinned. We've spoken against the Lord. We've spoken against you. Moses, Moshe, go intercede with the Lord that he might remove the serpents from us. They realized where it was coming from and what they needed to do, and they're finally turning the way that they should. And Moshe did intercede for the people. So the Lord said to Moshe, 
Make a fiery serpent. Now notice the word make. So this isn't a real fiery serpent. We are, we're going to be told that it's made out of bronze in just a moment. Verse 9 will tell us that. I bring it up now to tell you in Scripture, bronze is a picture of judgment. So God has sentenced them. They are under judgment. They are dying as consequences because of their disobedience and their griping and complaining and their turning against God. So God told Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a standard, that's like on a pole. And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. So basically Moses puts this bronze serpent on a stake and he's, it's somehow held up where they can look up to it. And when they look up to it, then they will live. Okay, Moses made the serpent, put it on the standard, and it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. What this was a picture of, because it's a picture of judgment on the stake, it's a picture foreshadowing of how the Messiah would come, and he would be put on a stake, lifted up, and all who looked to him would find salvation. So even in this, we have a picture of it. The serpent is not more powerful than God. The serpent will be used to fulfill God's purposes and his way. And he bore our sin just as they looking to that. It was as if they were saying they were putting their sin on this that they knew God had brought to them for redemption. The curse was taken on Yeshua, Jesus himself. The scripture says that anyone who hung on a tree was considered cursed. We'll talk more about that, I hope, in this lesson. But Yochanan, John 12, 31 and 32, says that he was lifted up for us, that if we behold him taking our judgment, we will be freed from it. So that's the picture. The same thing as what was happening here with the children of Israel was to draw their attention to the one who would come, who would be lifted up, who would take our sin when we look to him and, and give it to him. It also shows the, that the serpent, Satan, he's receiving the full impact of the curse that was laid on Messiah. That serpent is dead. That serpent is crushed. That serpent wasn't alive on that stake. God is alive, always alive, and he, well, in the person of Yeshua Jesus, the, the second part of our triunity, our triune God, took it on for us. <coughs> That's encouraging because as we go back now into Genesis, we're going to go back to where we, we read the curse that is going to come on, the well, we've already read the serpent, but I think it, it does, it's reiterated, so we'll read it again about the serpent, the woman, the man, earth, and the human race to follow. All are going to suffer consequences. All are going to be under this curse. The judgment is given first about the woman. That's verse 16 where we're picking up word by word now. And it's, it's really a telling of what would be a fall of the woman. What are the results of her sin? Okay? Um, and the sin, remember, if, if you're not familiar with the story, they had eaten the fruit from the tree that God had told them not to eat from. They tried to blame someone else. God doesn't let anyone off the hook. Eve ate it. She's in trouble for it. Adam ate it. He's in trouble for it. She couldn't blame the serpent. Adam couldn't blame Eve and God as he tried. We need to take a lesson from that today because how many people, when they're caught in something wrong, want to blame someone else. We need to just own up to it and thank God for her. Yes, look at the serpent like that, that we might be forgiven. Yes. So the curse on the woman says to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children. That pain and the pain that continues through motherhood, and I don't know a mother that doesn't suffer pain because of her kids right. all through their lives. <laughs> There's many joys too, don't get me wrong, but that pain would be a constant reminder of the effect of sin. Sin is painful. Sin brings horrible consequences. Sin is, is demoralizing to the people. They, they will suffer because the human <coughs> race will be born in sin. She will have children, but they're going to be born into that sin nature. There isn't a, a one that is born naturally that does not come with that sin nature. They don't learn it. They're not perfect little babies and, and one day decide that, oh, I'm not going to do it right. They inherit it. 
the reason why Yeshua had to be virgin born could not come through that same way as then he would have come in through that sin line. But the virgin birth spared him from that. He being fully God yet fully man did not have that sin nature. But for the woman, she would have that constant reminder every time she's suffering with her children or in pain to, to give birth to her children, she would suffer um, the, the consequences. I'm going to bring it out later. Maybe I'll bring it out now. Let's, let's run over to John, Yochanan, John 16 and verse 21, because I think this is, if I'm remembering it right, I think, if not, I've got a thought. Uh, no, 1221 was, uh, 1231 was earlier where um, it was a picture of the Son of Man being lifted up uh, for us. This is Yohanan 16 and verse 21. Yeah, this, this is where I like the second part, okay? Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. And if you've ever gone through childbirth with anyone, I think you all know the, the truth of that matter. They can have a, a horrible labor time and go through, you know, so much pain. Mm -hmm. And yet when they got that precious little bundle, the joy that comes from that bundle, how many turn around and have another one? in spite they forget how bad that pain was <laughs> and they hold on to the joy what I'm saying about that is even when she was being reminded of the pain and the sorrow that sin brought on she also in the joy of the child could look to the joy of the child that would be born fully God fully man who would take away the sin of the world so that one day we can live in the state that God had wanted us to have in the first place. So even in the midst of pain and sorrow and suffering and all that comes on because of sin, look for that, I guess I'll call it the silver lining, look for that rainbow that reminds you, but God has promised, He has saved us, we will be delivered. Okay? Just be encouraged. The earth suffers in travail, like in labor pains also. Romans 8, before you go back to Genesis, go to Romans 8, tells us this, that the dom domain, the dominion that was Adam's was this earth. We know first it was Satan's. We know when he was judged, the earth became chaotic in form. And then we have our recreation that we've been given. Well, here we see that the earth again, poor earth, <laughs> is going to suffer because of what Adam and Eve did. Romans 8, 20 and 21, let's start with 19. Romans 8, 19, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. It was futile. It was pointless. It, it lost it, its its way, really. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What that's saying is, yes, earth suffers the consequences because of their sin that brought the consequence on their kingdom, also their do the dominion, the domain, but just as they will be set free, earth has that hope also looking to that day when the earth will be set free from the curse also and that will come it is promised and it will come so even though the earth suffers because of um, man earth will also be released from that suffering uh, because of the son of man because of Yeshua Jesus and what he will do when he brings us to that point in the story. A little further from us right now. Not a whole lot, I don't think. No. Anyway, um, what else for the woman also? Um, we're, we're still in verse 16. The last phrase, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. She will keep looking to her husband, keep turning to her husband. He's going to be over her, but it's not going to be always in a good way. Um, even though marriage will be painful, will be full of sorrow at times, there's still everyone's going to desire to be in that kind of relationship. Yet when the man rules over the woman in a way that's not godly, then we've got, again, the consequence that came in because of sin. Remember how God made them? 
jointly. We mm -hmm. talked about that. That they, she was not made less than. She was not made inferior. She was not made under. She was made to be an equal partner to him. He was given something he was to do for God, and she was brought along as the help me to help him do it, which in essence almost spells out that she would be stronger to help him where he wasn't as strong. I say almost because before sin there wasn't a weakness and an inability. But it, my point in it from the Hebrew is there's nothing in there that equates with the woman being second class or needs to be subjected. That's not how God originally planned it, but in the warp that sin has brought, we see that many a time. And we see women suffer greatly under men who are selfish, who are under themselves, who are not being a godly example. Because when we look at the double meaning, and we look at the man being the head of the, the house, the head of the wife, and we see it in Ephesians 5, and let's go there real quickly. When we see it in, in this capacity, we see the way that God even ordained that to be here. And if it's done in a godly manner, the woman has no problem. Um, neither does the man. But it has to be in the godly way, or it doesn't work. Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23, wives should submit to their husbands as they do to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, just as Messiah is the head of the church, or the Messianic community, depending on what version you're reading, is himself the one who keeps the body safe. Now, how did the Lord keep us safe? How does the Lord keep us safe? How is he, when we say he's the head and we're the body making up the church, how is that? What did he do for us? He laid down his life for us. If you have a husband that is exemplifying to his wife what the Lord did for his bride, us, then she's going to have no problem submitting to him because she's going to be so loved and so cared for that it's going to be very easy for her to work with him and to be helping him and to be, be building him up because she's going to be loved to the point that he's willing to give up his life for her. Now, if you see that, you see one acting in the, the head of the home, acting in the way that the Lord acts toward his church, you've got a great godly example. And I promise you, you'll find a happy wife there. So God had it planned, even in the midst of sin, to show us an orderliness, to show us he as the head, to show us this fulfillment that we can see today. So it, it shows us sin brought the inequality. Salvation brings a, a co-equal, again, each one valued. And we know that in Christ, in Messiah, in salvation, we're not male or female. We're not free or enslaved. We're not rich or poor. It's an equal footing. And there are no grandchildren either, by the way. You're either his or you're not, and you want to be his. So... The woman would see an imbalance, would see suffering in these areas because of sin, not because God made her less. Remember even the, the Jewish proverb, and I can't quote it all right now, but basically that she wasn't made out of his head to be his head or over his head. She wasn't made out of his feet to be trampled underfoot by him. She was made out of his side to be that co-equal helpmate the, at his side, close to his heart so she would feel his love. That's what God ordained. But sin brought a lot of consequences, and it's not often, or always, I should say, what we see nowadays. So what about the man? Did he get off scot-free? Was it just she? Of course not. To Adam, to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife, he put her voice above God's voice. Because you listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Remember, Adam tried to blame his wife? Well, God's bringing him right back. I gave you the commandment. You didn't listen to my voice because you didn't, and you listened to her voice. You are also going to suffer consequences. Cursed is the ground because of you. Here's what happened to the earth. Here's the curse. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Ground or earth, it's the same thing. And it's saying because of Adam, it's better, really, honestly, it's better that suffering and death um, accompany this sin, that rebelliousness, that, that 
separated him from his God because if evil was allowed to continue to grow, never die, never end, if it was permitted to thrive and checked, can you imagine if this world is this evil now? Put that on steroids, and that's what it would have been. It's better that there's the, the final consequence, which I'm talking about being death, than it would be for wickedness to just proliferate and continue and grow and grow and grow, and there never be an end. I'll tell you what my nightmare would be, living in a world like this forever. A world that can have what's going on in, in Russia yes. and Ukraine and it's what takes sin. place in Israel daily and then even here in America, the the murderings that, that take place over the innocent. I thank God in his eternal plan, this is the drop in the bucket. Eternity is not that way for us that are in him. But this this really was God's mercy to bring to a death, to bring to now. To allow us to know we get out of the suffering. It's not going to go on for millions of years. Wouldn't that be, like I said, wouldn't that be your nightmare? It would certainly be my nightmare. <laughs> okay, so. Sorry, the wind's kicked up and my allergies are starting to, which I don't even know I've got much, but I do. Anyway, um, the curse is on the whole environment, and it would force man to realize the seriousness of his sin. Look at the consequences around you. You know, it wasn't just you. Your wife is suffering. Your earth is suffering. You're suffering. There's, there's a lot of consequence, and you are helpless to save yourself. We all need to realize that, and we all need to realize how thankful we are to the Lord for not leaving us like that with no hope and with no change. Um, laboring now, he'd have to labor to stay alive. He had it made in the Garden of Eden. He didn't have to worry about staying alive, he would have kept living, but now it's going to be an effort to stay alive, and that will also help him, because he's going to have to be busy doing the things that he's got to do, that will help him not be um, as quick to follow Satan, and to be hands and feet for Satan. Because when we're busy, especially if you're busy working for the Lord, you're not going to be the, tef the devil's um, hands and feet. You're not going to be his tools as easily. Um, in other words, they say idleness is the devil's playground, and we see that. A man who doesn't raise up and spend his time in work, who's a lazy man, often where, do they, where does it lead? Into alcohol, into all kinds of debauchery that comes with that. But the one who is the hard worker stays on more the straight and narrow. So it would be a good reminder, good bring them back in and, and show them that what Satan is tempting you with, it may not be, you know, everything that sparkles isn't gold, folks. <laughs> I'm sure Adam and Eve would like to have gone back and redone with what they knew now. They don't get that chance. We do know what's around us and what comes from disobedience, and we need to behoove it and help let it help us stay straight. So again, it would encourage them to look back to God, to be obedient to his word, to hear him. Remember, that's what the Lord just pointed out to Adam. You didn't heed my voice. You listened to the voice of someone else. We all need to hear the voice of the Lord. Follow the voice of the Lord in your life and, and guarantee you, anytime you don't, there will be regrets. Here's our great lesson. How's he going to have to be now in that hard labor and in sorrow? He's toiling with the ground. It, it was easy before. All he had to do was pick the fruit and eat it. There was no effort. And his work in the garden was joyful and pleasant. It was, it was a joyous, it wasn't a chore. Now it's going to be hard work. Now he's going to have to fight with all the elements, the bugs that would be eating his crops, the weather that would destroy the crops. I feel for farmers who can put all that labor. They're out there toiling day and night, early hours, late hours. They're working by the sweat of their brow. We'll even talk about that. You see that effort to break up that ground, to plow it, to be able to put in the, the seed. And then they have to water it, and they have to fertilize it. And they do all of this. And it goes on for a number of months. And then right when it's just before harvest time, here comes a thunderstorm, and it's destroyed. And not only is that all that hard work gone, but now, how's he going to feed his family? 
that was going to go to the market and it was going to buy them or you know the people would buy it from them and then they'd have money to buy it for their needs that's a horrible hard life now and Adam had to to work it now he was under this curse before it was all joy now it's it's an effort and now he'd be weary he'd get tired his body would ache why the aches we can understand <laughs> So the curse on the earth was really on Adam, Adam also. We'll talk a little bit more, a couple more points as we go on. Uh, verse 18, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. Um, that would hinder man from providing for himself. It would cause him pain and suffering in, in his work and how he'd have to work around it. Can't you imagine how wonderful it would be to smell a rose and not get pricked by the thorn? <laughs> okay, so everything's going to have thorns and thistles and weeds and bull weevils and bugs and issues and, and you know, hard soil that can't even um, produce good uh, versus a soil that's more fertile but has other issues. Uh, and you will eat the plants of the field, okay? They're going from just the fruits of the trees now, they're going to eat the plants, the herbs, you know, and that sort of thing. That would be their diet, okay? Change in diet. By the sweat of your face or of your brow, you will eat bread. Again, I think we've talked about it. It shows the intense struggle against the environment. He's sweating because it's hard work. But he'll have to do that to enable, to, to enable him to eat. And he will get to eat because of it. And he'll have to do this until you return to the ground. This was that total change too. Returning to the ground is speaking of physical death. It is not talking about sensation of consciousness. Let me show you that when you leave this physical body, you're separated from your spirit, which is the real you. There are those who want to believe that when you die, that's it. It's over. You're buried in the ground. You go back to the dust of the earth, and that's it. No consequence. It's done. It's over. You hear the expression, take it all in because you only go around once, and it's over. Many people want to think this way, but God gives no room for that. The spirit, remember we talked about, came into man. Man became a living soul. That spirit was from God. That cannot be, when he breathed in, his spirit come in to make Adam alive, that can't die any more than God can die. That's what lives on forever. Let me show you in scripture, we see the consciousness of people who have left their bodies, physically died, and we're looking at them after that point. Go with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16 is not a parable. It's in the midst of some parables that the Lord was telling, but the way that you know the difference, and a parable is a story to teach a, a good, um, what do you call it, moral. Um, the way that you know the difference is anytime a person's name it's not a parable, it's a real story. God doesn't make up parables with false names. Anytime you have a person named in scripture, they were a real person, they really lived, da 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 da. Okay, so in this, the rich man and Lazarus, we don't have the rich man's name, but we have Lazarus' name. So this tells us that this it was a real person who lived on this earth prior to this um, story that the Lord's telling. Now there was a rich man, he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. I started with verse 19 if I failed to say that. What did you say, Luke what? 16, 19. We're now at 16, 20. Oh. And, <coughs> excuse me. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man who lived a horrible life, he, all he could do was bed, he was, he was lame and he, he suffered. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is a, uh, another name for Sheol, for the paradise side of Sheol. Okay, we're going to see that. We're going to see that he's fine where he is. The rich man also died and was buried. Doesn't say he was taken to Abraham's bosom. In fact, verse 23 says, in Hades. Hades is the Greek word, its equivalence is hell. 
in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried out and said, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the, the tip of his finger in the water and cool off my tongue. I'm in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, bad things. But now you re uh, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. How far did I want to read? I think I've gone farther than I was intending to read. Let me stop there. But do you see how both the, the Abraham, Lazarus, and the rich man all have consciousness? The rich man saw that Lazarus is being comforted in the presence of Abraham, why it was called Abraham's bosom. It's like Abraham's house. Now what we have is, this was in the heart of the earth, Sheol is the Hebrew word, S-H-E-O-L. It had two compartments, for lack of a better word, two holding tanks, whatever you want to call it. One was Abraham's bosom. It was like paradise. It was comfort, no suffering. The other was equal to what's called Hades. It obviously leads toward what will be hell. It will be put into hell. Um, in the future, but it's equal to hell, it's suffering. So you have the two places, when man leaves his earth, he either goes into a place of paradise or a place of suffering. Now it's not in the heart of the earth now, we're going to talk about that as we move on, so I won't explain it right now, but just take my word for it till I back it up and show you in scripture, heaven now, paradise, Abraham's bosom is in heaven, and the heart of the earth still is a holding tank for those who go into suffering who will eventually be in hell. Okay, that's from Luke. Let me take you to Revelation. Let you see two or three witnesses. Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, we want to start with verse 9. It says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls excuse me, of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony which they had maintained. Okay, these are people under the altar in heaven. They got there because they had kept the word of God and they had kept the testimony. The testimony, the word that we get is martyr from that. They had literally kept the testimony of believing in the Lord and it cost them their life. They were under the throne in heaven and they're crying out up there. They're saying it with a loud voice in verse 10. How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Come on, Lord, give them what they deserve. <laughs> they took our lives. We're here where it's wonderful, but we're longing to see justice done to those who did such evil on the earth. Notice how they're conscious. Notice how they're thinking. Notice how they're aware of their circumstances. Life does not end when the body ends. The physical body turns to the, the dust of the ground, the ashes, the elements that was created from. Because remember, God created Adam out of the ground. So it goes back to the ground, but the spirit lives on eternally. And it's the spirit that you have to be right with God to be with him, or it goes into eternal separation from God. So we see, really, there was a lot put on this world and on mankind uh, from the curse. And, again, we'll say a little bit more um, about some of these as we go on because of, of what the scripture will bring out. Let me bring this out, though. I like this picture that was drawn. Again, this is not original, but I like it. We see... Oh, sorry. My kitty just jumped in Dora's face. Sorry. <laughs> you, you can encourage him down. He's, he's, he knows better. No, 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 no. How about the dog? <laughs> I can't get out Max, get down, sweetie. Okay. Sweetie. Go here. Go Roger, here. can you come out? We'll go here. Sorry, sure. folks. Sorry, folks. Come here. Her. Come here. Look at me. Come here. Come on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me sin isn't in this whole world. My little guy who I love it is not 100% perfect. Yeah. Where's <laughs> the other one? He's disobedient, hiding, because there's a lot of people here. <laughs> His sister's hiding. He just loves to be in the center of it all. Sorry, folks. Okay, this is a beautiful picture of, of Yeshua Jesus. You know, we've said it in the scriptures before. He's called the second Adam. 
First Adam came, the, the consequences are sin in this world. Second Adam came, the consequences are salvation for us. Well, how did, he, how did we see this comparison? He, the second Adam, Yeshua Jesus, was made a curse for us. That's what Galatians 3.13 says. Turn to Galatians 3.13. Is this on these things? Yes, it's on your cross-references. Oh, I think I only have the second one. Okay, I'll give you more later then, but okay. yeah, if you want to just listen, my tablet's giving Galatians me Galatians what? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. I can give it to you if right I after class. If I here, I, can I go the rest from this way? Yes, yes. Okay, um, yeah, just I'm, I'm meander through my right? apologies. I should have some more. I should have room over here. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize we thought right. the way. I have to go back. Go back whichever way you can. Yeah, that's okay. Because it just goes around. Okay, this is what we get for zooming from home. Sorry, folks, but thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I love this picture too. I want to be able to bring it out. I'll tell you, somebody's alive and well who doesn't like how I started this class condemning him to where he belongs, <laughs> and he's getting condemned again. In yeah. the name of the Lord, be gone and keep on going, Satan. <laughs> okay, um, Galatians three thirteen. Christ, Messiah, redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And we'll be talking about him hanging on that tree in just a little bit, hopefully in this class today. So we've got our, our second Adam, our last Adam. We have Messiah. <laughs> okay, who was made a curse for us. Remember, we're talking about the curse that came on man. He was made a curse for us. Then it also... Michelle, yes, Maria. Michelle, you, you, you read Galatians 3.13? Yes. Did I not? Yes, Galatians. Uh, no, because it, it, I, I'm looking at... Gal never mind, never mind. Okay, Galatians 3.13. Okay, never mind. Thank you. Okay. You're I welcome. couldn't, I said, I was like a different, I was on Colossians. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. Remember our little books? Gentiles eat pork chops. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't we hear gone. that. The next two lines are even better. The next two lines are even better in order that in Christ Jesus, in Messiah Yeshua, the blessing of Abraham, Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Yes. Yes, that's a excellent also. And yes, you Thank dear you. Gentiles are Thank just you. as loved, brought in on equal footing. It's not a better than a less than. It's not a second whatever. It's all, it's all um, equal. I'm sorry. Obviously, I'm sidetracked from my surroundings. Sorry. <laughs> are we okay? Legs bothering her. Okay, okay. Keep Jeanette in prayer. She's physically having some issues, so Lord, even heal her right now. He did, yeah, no, he did. Okay, Con continuing on. Um, where are we? I forgot where we Oh, we're back where we went. Okay, I'm bringing out the picture that we see of all this curse, and we see how the Lord paid the price for us. So, first Adam was cursed. We just read that Yeshua Jesus was cursed for us. Then we read that he was a man of sorrows. Genesis 3, verse 17 said, and I'm reading it to you again. You don't have to go back there. We'll go back eventually. But verse 17, um, he told Adam, because he listened to the voice of the wife, curse is the ground because of you and toil. You'll eat all the days of your life. Your thorns and thistles. We have all these sorrows that would come on man because of what he had done. Now Isaiah 53, 3 tells us, and I'm turning there as soon as my tablet will work. Isaiah 53.3 says, He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So was the Lord himself not a man of sorrows? The same as what was brought onto Adam. Then remember I just read that thorns and thistles would be part of what he had to work through? Well, look at who wore thorns for thorns. us. He wore thorns for us. Go to Mark uh, 15, 17. And I think you're beginning to get the picture now. This is, it's an amazing picture, I think. Okay. 
Sorry, folks, having trouble with my fingers and my tablet. Mark 15 <coughs> and verse 17, where we read, They dressed him in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And we know this is when they were beginning to take him down the road to crucifixion. So he wore the very thorns that were Adam's curse as a crown on his head. When we read that Adam suffers in the agony of labor, we read in verse 19 that he had, um, uh, they kept beating him with a reed, spitting on him, kneeling and bowing before him. They mock him, all of this. That's not the verse, but we read that he sweat great drops of blood. That's how great the agony was. Luke 22:44. Luke 22:44, and we know that if anyone who suffers greatly, if you're under that kind of extreme duress, the capillaries break down, and you do sweat blood, which is what Yeshua Jesus did for us. Verse 44, Luke 22, and being in agony. He was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. He took on that labor, that heavy sweat and suffering that Adam was condemned to. And finally, God even brought him down to the dust of the earth. Now, his body did not see decay, so the picture is not a perfect picture, but he was brought to the point of death. He did die. The theory out there that he just swooned on the cross and then he resuscitated in the cool cave that was the tomb, no. He died, and proof of his death was the spear in his side that showed blood and water pouring out. He had died, died of, of um, crucifixion of a broken heart. But here that we see that, that he suffered completely to the point of death for us, Psalm 22 and verse 15. And Psalm 22 is a picture of crucifixion written at least 700 years before crucifixion was even a mode of execution. Verse 15 says, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. We know Yeshua Jesus fulfilled every bit of this prophetic song, and at the same time completed every bit of the curse that was taken on, uh, put on Adam, and the human race, he is now taken on himself. And the victory comes in his coming out of that death, being brought into eternal, abundant life that he can freely give to us. That is amazing. It is amazing love and amazing grace. In so doing, in him taking it on himself, he erased the curse from us. He restores man to the position where man will have again dominion over everything he lost. And he'll realize that on earth during the millennium, read that in Revelation 20. Um, let me also bring you to Romans 8, 19 to 21. First. We'll go to Romans. We're not going to go to Revelation. We'll just go to Romans. Romans 8, 19 to 21, where we read, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. We read that earlier. In fact, I read all of this earlier. Creation being subjected to futility, it has that hope. Here's what the hope is. Verse 21, that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Our glory, we know, our future is, is perfect. And so the earth itself also will be released from that curse. And everything was redeemed by the Lord. What an amazing picture of the ultimate price that our Lord paid to take the full course, curse for us. It's uh, also seen around us in the sense you see morning always follows night. And I'm talking day and night. Spring always follows winter. It's as if God's always reminding us there's hope. There is hope. It's coming. It's coming. And uh, one day the curse will be removed. It will be wonderful to see an earth that doesn't have a curse on it. Um, it could be the removal, the removal of the curse, not everything perfectly like in eternity future, but the removal of the curse could be why people are able to live the thousand years of the millennium. Maybe because this curse of the body decaying and you know turning to, to the dust has been removed. Um, 
we don't know because there is still death during the millennium and at the end of the millennium. So I know it's not been totally removed, but that's judgment for their sin at that time. When they, again, rebel against God, that's when they'll, they'll lose their earthly life. So, how do we apply this today? Why do I tell you that a story almost 6,000 years old is relevant to you today? If you told me that, that uh, what happened to George Washington in his personal life in one day could make a difference to me today, I'd be saying, okay, how? Well, here is how we can see this and apply this to ourselves. We all are under this curse. We all have sorrows, do we not? Mm -hmm. Yet, because of the Lord, in sorrow, yet always rejoicing. That's 2 Corinthians 6.10. That's what we're told. Even in the midst of our sorrow, we have the ability to be rejoicing. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 10 and that is totally because of the Lord it's not because of us it is the Lord 1st Corinthians 6 10 as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing yet possessing all things when you're in sorrow when you are suffering when you are discouraged with it you need to look at your future you need to look at the eternal promises of the Lord. And when you do, when you realize what your future is, it will bring you his joy. It will lift your load at least somewhat in the midst of the struggle. We still here at this time have to endure thorns. Paul said, I've got a thorn in the flesh. Okay? Something that in his body, his fleshly body, caused him great agony. But look at how we're not left in that agonizing state. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You're in 6. Just run over to chapter 12, and we'll start with verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, and I read, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, because of what's been revealed to us, for this reason, to keep, oh, actually, sorry, this is Paul speaking. Because God had given Paul so much, Paul had been privy to seeing things no one else has seen. He, he tells us at one point, I don't know whether I was in or out of my body, but I was in the third heaven of God, and I can't tell you what I saw. He saw so much. He knew so much. God poured into him what we get for most of our new covenant. The books that he wrote, God personally taught him, took him on, we call it the backside of the desert, but he one on one taught him. Paul went to the school of God. <laughs> he didn't go to school of theology. He didn't go to school here on, on earth, even though he had been trained well in his Hebrew background. This came directly from God. Well, it was so much, and it was so great that Paul could be caught up and think, you know, wow, I'm really something. I've been with God, and God's taught me personally, and God's shown me this, and God's put me above you. And so for God to keep him humble, God allowed him to have this thorn in his side. He says it was to keep me from exalting myself, keep me from feeling like I'm better than everybody else and I've got it made. So God allowed him to suffer. He said there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Sometimes I think our thorns, we feel like it's Satan poking us. Poking is for you. I'm poking you. <laughs> and you all know how irritating a poke can be. Well, something constantly bothered Paul. And it made him feel that, that torment, feel that agony. So what would he do with that? Cry out to the Lord. I need you, Lord. I need your grace. I need your help. I need your strength. I need you to help me conquer this. It kept him humble because he realized he needed to depend on the Lord. That's for us also. We realize, as Paul said, he took it to the Lord. He says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Three different times I picture Paul getting on his knees and begging the Lord, please, this one's too much for me. This one bothers me too much. This one hurts too much. Take it away, Lord. Take it away, Lord. Take it away, Lord. All three times he asked, and you would think if anybody deserves, it would be Paul. Shows us we don't get because we deserve. But anyway, Paul, uh, the Lord said to Paul, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And that's the secret. When we're weak, he's strong. 
And God was telling Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace will help you get through that. And not only will it help you get through it, but in that, it's going to perfect you. It's going to strengthen you. Because here's where we read, Paul saying, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. If we think we got it all and we don't need the Lord, we don't know his grace. We don't know his love. We don't know victory. And we really would be no earthly good to anyone else because how do we encourage each other? Yeah, you know what? I've had that same problem. I understand how you're feeling. Or even if my problem isn't the same as yours, I know that when I had such a heartache, this is how the Lord comforted me. This is how the Lord enabled me to go on. I can tell you two pastors that come to mind immediately that both lost suddenly a loved one in their family. One lost wife and daughter separate years, not the same year, went through it twice. Another lost his son. All of them, these pastors, one of them, it was Saturday night that it happened, Sunday morning they were in the pulpit. They were in a big church, there were plenty of other pastors who could take over, and they said, no, that's exactly where I've got to be. They knew they had to be in the place where they were depending on the Lord and where he would meet them, wow. and he lifted Great them up and carried them through. Yeah, because yeah. he did his son. Yeah. Yeah, the son. Yeah. And uh, John Corson's another one that lost wife and daughter, Six, 16 years apart, something like that, but almost identical accidents, car accidents. It was, you would think once is bad enough, to, but they had the wound open again. And yet he is faithfully saying, but God met me in that weakness. God strengthened me in it. God gave me the ability to go on. Does that not encourage us? Yes. Do we not say, wow, if... God can help him get through that. God can help me get through this. Mm -hmm. That's what God is doing. Why are we reading this? Because Adam and Eve suffered great consequences. I feel for them. There are those who have a bad attitude. Well, I'll tell you, if you would have done any better, God would have put you in the garden. But nobody would have done any better. And rather than get upset at them, look at the consequences they had to pay. It's huge what they had to pay because they'd been walking with God in the cool evening and they were in that wonderful environment, like a perfect environment. They knew what they lost. We've never had that personally. We walk with the Lord, don't get me wrong, but not in the same way face to face. We long to see the Lord face to face. Do we not? When we have our sufferings, what's the first thing we're saying? Lord, beam me up. Can't it be time? Can't I come home? Can't I see your face now? <laughs> we long for it. But we can learn from them because Adam and Eve made it through. Questions asked, will they be in heaven? Answer, yes. God's salvation was for all. They don't suffer any greater consequence than anybody else. They're not cut out for any reason. And I'll preview that from Scripture as we go on. It'll come up a couple more times in the next couple of verses, and I think I can get there. So I'm not going to say it right now. Just remember the thought. But our labor, we sometimes labor over something. We should labor over the things that are important, not just things that are not. But remember, Adam and Eve were given the curse of having to labor now, or Adam in particular, to, to, um, for survival. Look at what Paul says. Let's take you to Acts 20 and verse 31. You think Paul knew labor? Did he, did he know it by the sweat of his brow, or did he know it in a different way? And look what he labors over. Acts 20 and verse 31. Shaol Paul, and it's he talking. He's giving um, charge to the people, telling them what they need to, to know and how they need to act and be. And he says, therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. This was one of his little church plants. He cared so much about these people. He literally cried for them day and night for three years that they might get it right, get it together, get saved, and move on with the Lord. That's agony. That's laboring. There are people who say, oh, pastors, they're lazy people. They got it made. They just have to preach that sermon for one hour on Sunday, and they get to play golf the rest of the week. Well, I have news for you. Anyone who is a true pastor, a true shepherd at heart, 
who cares about his flock is laboring day and night and many a time in tears for the sheep in his pasture and he's living anything but a kickback easygoing life there's much more behind the scenes than what you think for a pastor who has a heart that cares like Shaul Paul did as a pastor to all he was speaking to literally to us today because he speaks to us through his word and the made conformable to his death that phrase that also we know the power of his resurrection we know that we're not dead and advance we know that life everlasting in the perfect is coming for us and that is such an encouragement to us go with me to Philippians 310 who Philippians oh, Philip's book <laughs> wasn't Philip though Paul wrote it was to the people who lived in Philippi that's why it's called Philippians because the people were called Philippians oh, Philippians what 310 Paul is speaking to this church. He, this is one of his little church plants. These are his babies, and he's saying in verse 10 that I may know him, know Messiah, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. By us conforming to the death that Messiah did on the cross for us, we also come into his resurrection. That's what it's saying that we're made conformable unto his death. We don't fight it, we accept it that his death in our place and when we come into that and we allow him to work in us his life, we die and he lives. Another way that, that, that uh, Paul said it was that he daily crucifies the flesh, that he's gotta put himself down so that he doesn't live, but Christ in him lives. And that's what we know. When we are willing to die in Messiah, we come to life in the abundant life, even here on this earth now, and live in a spiritual sense above our circumstances. Do we stay that way all the time? That's our goal. That's our attempt. We have our struggles, but this is what the Lord is doing and it's perfecting us. That's why it says from glory to glory, because as we move and learn and grow, we're able to handle more and stay in that conformity to us being dead, yet alive in Messiah. So, 6,000 year old story, does it speak today? Yes. I think it's pretty relevant. I don't think there's a one of us that hasn't had to deal with suffering, mm -hmm. laboring, consequences of death, I think it's touched us all. Everything that we see still affects us, and here is the fulfillment that we see. And here's where we got it over Adam, because he didn't have scripture to look to to comfort. He didn't have other examples. We have a whole hall of faith, we call it, Hebrews 11, of those who suffered and stayed victorious in the Lord to encourage us. And if you ever think you've got it bad, go read Hebrews 11. If you've got it as bad as them, then start your woe is me and have your pity party. But then realize even those in Hebrews 11 didn't do that. <laughs> okay, so we will go back to Genesis 3. Are we okay? Genesis 3, and we are, I think, ready for verse 20. Yes, because we've already talked about the body turns back to dust. Okay, so verse 20 says... Now the man called his wife's name Eve. This is the first time she's called Eve. In our Hebrew, what we've had up until this point is man was called Ish, and because woman came from man, she was called Isha, man, woman. How'd you spell Ish it? and Isha, I-S-H, and an I-S-H-A for, for the female, okay? So up until now, we, we heard um, I think we were given the name Adam earlier. I think I brought that out. I, I forget whether <laughs> I'm, because I study ahead, I forget whether it's coming or whether it was the past. If I haven't taught it to you, it will come. But I believe we have the name ahead. But we've got the new name here. We've got that his wife's name is now called Eve. That's our English. Our Hebrew word is Chava. C-H-A-V as in victory, A-H. Who's that? Eve. I thought it was Ish. Ish means woman. Oh. The woman was now given the name Chava. In your English, the woman was given the name Eve. How do you Eve. spell Chava? C-H-A-V-A. 
V is in victory, A, H. Okay, Chava. Because Chava means life, life giver. She's going to be the one to propagate the human race physically. So even though, really because of sin, she's the mother of all dying, because we all are born and start dying, yet she was given the name Chava, meaning life giver, that life would come from her. This, I believe, even was showing their faith that God was going to carry on as he had promised them the Redeemer in verse 15. So the mother of all living, in essence, indicates Adam's faith, his faith in that what God promised, that her seed would bring salvation. That's life out of death. Because remember, they don't have an example in front of them. We grew up seeing that people had babies that uh, a mama carries uh, the fetus for nine months and then delivers a baby. We, we see that, so we know that, and we grow up with that knowledge. Adam and Eve didn't have that. There wasn't anybody ahead of them to show them that. So even to be told, you're going to bear life, see, they hadn't had, had children yet. That all they had to take by faith. I don't understand you, God. I don't know how this can be. You formed us, you know, they might have thought God would have to form every human, that he had made this promise. And Adam's faith, Adam and Eve, I'm using that together, showed their faith. They probably believed that Eve would personally give birth to that seed that we read about in Genesis 3.15 and Galatians 3.13 tells us the seed is Messiah. The seed is Yeshua, Jesus. They probably thought Eve would give birth to the Messiah. Okay, this also indicates that they believed they needed repentance and salvation. That's why I say there is no doubt in my mind that Adam and Eve will be in heaven. They knew they needed forgiveness. They put their faith in God and how he said forgiveness would come. And they were looking for it. And this also refutes any teaching out there that there were any pre-Adamite people, that there were people living in the world outside the garden that were only told the story in the garden. Well, if there were other people out there, you don't think Adam and Eve would have been aware of the, the race of people outside of their garden? I got a garden in my house, but I know people live next door. <laughs> and even if the garden was large, still, I know people are living in, I'm in San Bernardino, there are people living in Highland, in Big Bear, in Redlands. There are people living around me that I can't see, but I know they're there. So there would have been some awareness had there been other people. If there had been other people, then if any of them had not sinned, why would God go through what he did? At the expense of his son giving his life. Why? why? Why not just wipe out Adam and Eve the same way that he did not bring redemption to the angels that sinned in his very presence? So no room for pre-Adamite people. Done. I don't think I need to say any more. I will have my case. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying. Maybe I am, I am in it. That's why I can't get it to go back. Okay, so verse 21. Where? Oh. In Genesis 3, we're back there. Verse 21 says, The Lord God, Jehovah Elohim. Remember, Jehovah, the one who's going to be in a personal, intimate relationship. He's going to be the name used with the covenant-keeping God. And Elohim, the strong, the mighty, the creator God. Both names given here. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Okay, we have to read the whole picture here. We're not given every single detail. If we were, we couldn't carry our Bible around. It would be so big. <laughs> okay? If there was garments made for them of skin... It was the first thing they killed. Then an animal had to have been slain. Yes. There had to have been life lost for them to have skins. Um, the picture is that they are clothed by God. By being clothed by God, they were made fit again to have fellowship with God. That's a picture of what the Lord does for us. When we come into his a sacrifice for us, his shed blood, then we're clothed with his robe of righteousness, 
And now we can even go into the presence of our God when we leave this earth. But until we're even home then, we can come into that right fellowship with God. Remember, it was broken. Remember they had, we think, some sort of a, a glory glow, shall I call it, a light around them that kept them from even seeing nakedness. Nakedness was a picture of the immorality against God, the disobedience to God. So what we're seeing is that God clothed them now. They lost the clothing they had. God has restored it for them now through his gift of salvation. A picture for us. And again, another reason why I say Adam and Eve are saved. That they came into the Lord's forgiveness. Where do I get that we put on the robe of righteousness in the Lord? Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah 61 and verse 10. Isaiah 61 10 there are other verses also I can't begin to give you everything exhaustively but this is a good one to, to prove it Isaiah 61 and verse 10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul will exalt in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation he has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He has clothed us, how did it say it? Clothed us with garments of salvation, wrapped us with a robe of righteousness, and then even bejeweled it, like a bride that gets all decked out for her bridegroom, for her the one that she's going to be married to. Is that not a picture of us with the Lord? So beautiful picture of what he has done for us. But notice the high cost. That robe of righteousness was made available by Messiah's death on the cross, the shedding of blood of the innocent one. That's why I believe it was an innocent animal that shed its blood, lost its life for Adam and Eve to be clothed, to be a picture for them of what was coming and to teach us also. And we're told there is no other way for forgiveness of sin but by shed blood. This is Leviticus, Viacra, Leviticus 17 and verse 11. And those of you who are following the um, parshas, the Jewish portions of scripture that are read yearly, we're coming into Leviticus now. This whole book is a, it's known as a bloody book. It's known about sacrifices. But everybody will say it's summed up in this verse. Leviticus, Viacra, chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, right there, let me just stop and pause and tell you, we know that today. Wasn't it George Washington that they leaked him of all his blood and that's why he died? I think it was George Washington, wasn't it? Really? Had, yes, because they thought that he had some sort of poison oh. in his blood. So they kept leaching his blood, taking okay. his blood out. If they'd realized, if they'd known scripture, they would know no blood, no life. This, this life, this human life is in the blood. If we're drained of our blood, we're dead. Okay, that's what it's saying. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. God's speaking now. I have given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. When did God put his blood on the altar to atone for us? On the cross. On the cross. In the, the, the body of his son. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. In other words, it took life to make the atonement. To bring us that eternal life. So what a beautiful picture we have in this, right from the start, right from the beginning. We see Messiah and his saving work for all of us. What love. What love. Adam and Eve were rescued from their sinful state the same way I'm rescued from my sinful state. Hallelujah. Praise our God. What a God we have. This it came is, on us because the animals. Yes. Yeah, with the high cost of sin. The curse that came in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's hard. It's very hard. And it's one of the things that some people stumble over. They don't want to think that someone else had to shed their blood for them. We deal with this especially with our Jewish people. That's a very hard thought for them to accept. But God told them. And he put it right here. He showed them in Bereshit. He confirmed it in Viagra all the way through. The, so it's the, Viagra. The, the, it is. That's the Viagra. It does. Oh. <laughs> it's a K, not a G, like a fault. <laughs> it's the Hebrew word for the book. <laughs> um, and the spellings are different, but yeah, a little too close. Okay, I'll watch what I say. 
<laughs> I'm used to using both. But what we see, this is the first revelation of the method of, of Genesis 3.15 being fulfilled. The first we see is right here where God clothed Adam and Eve. We see from this a great gospel sermon. This, this all summed up. Number one, to approach God, the guilty sinner needs a covering. You cannot come in in your sin into the presence of God. That covering, it was, um, okay, I'm looking ahead, but, but you all know the story. You know what's coming. So the covering made by human hands is not acceptable. There's nothing that the sinner can do. There's no way by his hands he can bring um, he can he can bring himself into an acceptable standard with God. What I'm referring to is Cain and Abel and their sacrifices. We're going to see Cain brings the fruit of his hands, but nothing was acceptable. It was only what God Himself provides for the covering. It's all His work. He does it all, and that necessary covering that God provides for us can only be obtained through shed blood through death. So we see the whole picture, the whole gospel right there in what God did for Adam and Eve. So again, it's what that about. My third point or fourth point that Adam and Eve are saved? <laughs> I think it's very clear. Okay, any questions, comments? Yes, but in there because I mean what sin didn't come in until the law. I mean, because before there was no sin, there was no I mean the sin started when Adam and yeah. Eve disobeyed God, right. when they ate from the tree. The curse of the law comes with the law. The law condemns us to death. Where there isn't a law, you can't be judged for it. But in essence, God gave Adam and Eve one law. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When they ate from it, sin entered the world. So sin entered through Adam, through Eve, right through the very beginning, prior to law. Okay, any other questions, comments? Are we good? Okay. Verse 22. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. I'll go back now. Yeah, we'll go back to Genesis 3. I've got to get back there too. Genesis 3 and verse 22. <clears throat> then the Lord God said, Behold, one of our first beholds, Behold. if you've been with me in Revelation, you know, pay attention, wake up. Um, behold, the man has become like one of us. Okay, again, who is God speaking to? Is he speaking to the angels? Or, or was man made like the angels? We know no. We know not. Man was made in the image of God. So again, God is speaking in essence to himself. He's speaking in the triunity. We see him speaking with the Son and with the Spirit, the three in one. Man has now made himself... Um, He's become like one of us, knowing good and evil. High cost. Remember, he didn't know evil until he sinned. Now he knows evil. So God realizes there's this change for man now. Now he might stretch out his hand, take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. And that's why I'm saying, oy gavol. That would be so horrible to live in this sinful state forever and that's what we're seeing that God was realizing and he's going to show his grace and his mercy man needs to realize the true nature the effects of living out of fellowship with God it is that suffering that's horrible but to live that way forever would be a, a sentence too much to bear and so to know and understand what God has done is he's brought us love and he's brought us grace so that we can desire to love him, we can walk with him only after this complete redemption in eternity will man be allowed to eat from the tree of life and live forever. In other words, in our human state today, nobody lives forever. All of us have an appointment with death. The exception in our day and age believing the rapture to be coming, those who get raptured won't see it. But in the, the law, the rule is if you're born, you die. Remember scripture even tells us that you need to be born again. You need you know, to live in the eternal, in the spiritual. But what God is saying here, he did not want man to live separated from him 
live in this eternal state of sin, or live in the state of sin eternally. He, that out of his mercy, he's going to block the way so that they cannot eat from the tree of life and live forever in that state. And again, I say, hallelujah. <laughs> I am so thankful this is not eternity. This is not how it's going to be. Now, let me show you that, that the tree of life will be eaten from again. When we get to eat from it, who gets to eat from it? Let me take you through scripture. Whoops. I'm in the wrong. There we go. Okay, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2 and verse 7. Revelation 2 and 3 are messages to the churches that uh, that through all the church age time we see it, it uh, follow in time, but we see the lessons learned not just in the periods, but continue on. Just like we're learning lessons from Adam and Eve almost 6,000 years later. Okay? Two. Chapter 2 and verse 7. Yes, chapter 2 and verse 7, this is to the church of Ephesus. This was the first message that went out. The message would go out, there would be a rebuke. This is overall, there are a couple of minor, well, there are major changes, but just for a couple of churches. But anyway, um, then they're told the reward, the, if they overcome, there'd be this reward. Verse 7 says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That gives us a hint where that tree is, because remember we've talked about where paradise is, okay? So we're going to eat from the tree of life when we're in paradise with God. Let's go see where that is, okay? <coughs> Run over to verse, I mean, sorry, chapter 21 of Revelation. Of Revelation. Yeah, of Revelation, okay? Verse? We're going to start with verse 1. Okay because I want you to see where we are at this point. We've gone through the tribulation, we've gone through the millennium, we've gone through Satan's final um, come up against God, we've come, we've come through the great white throne judgment, and we're finally poised to go into eternity future. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, the first earth passed away, there's no longer any sea. What we know down here, what we've been involved with, it's been done away with now. There is a more glorious now that is the eternal home. Um, verse 2 and on tells you about the new Yerushalayim. But where, because I'm focusing on the tree of life, look at verse 5. He who sits on the throne. We know who that is and we know where that is. In God's heaven. Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. Okay, so he's going to now tell more of what's going on. Where does the tree of life come in? Go to chapter 22, verse 1. Did I go? It didn't go. My tablet's having trouble. There we go. 22 and verse 1. So we know we're in the new heavens and the new earth, and then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. So if we're seeing the throne of God, we're seeing the Lamb, we're seeing God the Father, we're, we're, we know we're seeing our heaven, our eternal heaven, our future. And here we see in verse 2, in the middle of the street, uh, well, let me, I broke my, the flow of it. The river of water of life's flowing in the middle of the street on either side of the river, and it comes from the throne of God and the Lamb, on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So here's our tree, here's its fruit, it's in heaven, and access is to it. It sounds like we're going to eat from the tree of life. Okay, so this is after the tribulation or is it after the thousand years? Both. Tribulation, thousand years. It continues. This is after that. We're seeing the new heavens and the new earth in eternity after that time. Okay? Right now we know that God said paradise is with him. Okay? We know that that when we're absent from the body, we go home to be at the Lord. We know the Lord is on the throne with God the Father in heaven. That heaven, in some way, we have an eternal heaven description given. It's, it's it, I can't say it's greater than heaven, but it's the greatest heaven. I'll put it that way. That's the future. And there we see, and we're going to see that tree of life is in heaven right now. I'm going to show you that in a bit also. But that tree of life is 
in heaven forever. The eternal heaven that will be our eternal abode has the tree of life. Mm -hmm. It has the throne, it has God and lamb, the river coming out, and the, the trees on each side, and here's our tree of life, and we get to eat from its fruit. Yes, so. but you still didn't answer my question. Is it after the tribulation? Yes. Or after? Yeah, we're looking after the tribulation. Okay, so for the thousand years. The thousand years is on earth. The millennium is how what happens on earth. The tree of life is still in heaven. Okay. And after. it'll stay in heaven. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I believe the tree of life is in heaven now, mm -hmm. and I believe it stays in heaven for all of eternity. Okay, that's what I'm showing, and that that's what we okay. eat from because we're in heaven there, and it tells us that the, there's different fruit, and even the leaves are for the nations. When it says the healing of the nations, it's not that the nations get sick in eternity future because sickness is because of sin and it's done away with, but in the same way that that eating from the tree of life keeps them living, eating the leaves from the trees keep them healed, keep them in a healthy state. Okay, so or could it, could it be also, Rochelle, that, that that was the tree that was used, you know, for the healing of the nations, and is there, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's because if you, if you keep on reading, it says on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit. Yes. Now, it, it, it's not that it's, it, it's either. It doesn't say on, it doesn't say on both side of this uh, uh, side of the river is either. It sounds to me like we've got, um, you know, to us we're we're human and we're thinking Earth, but it sounds to me like we've got a tree that's able to grow on both sides of the river, that is on either side of the river. That uh, okay. you know, um, again. Don't limit in your view, because if you're like me, it's very hard to comprehend how huge yeah. heaven is. That river may be miles wide, you know. Don't make it a little stream that you can draw with a pencil line, you know. We don't know right, how right. big, but the access to the tree of life is available, whether you're here or whether you're there, is what I believe God is saying, that the access to it is available. Could that also be a representation of God the Father and God the Son, you know, on either side? I mean, I don't know. Well, you've got them at the top of it because he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. So in my little peon brain, I picture God and the Lamb on the left seat built for two, the equal throne. I picture coming down from that throne a river of washing water, and we'll talk about the symbolism of water being the Holy Spirit, being cleansing, purity, all of that. And being clear as crystal allows the reflection of what I think is the rainbows that are all over that I've brought out before. And then when you get past seeing this river coming out of the throne, you see that that river has been feeding these trees, and these trees are prolific and beautiful, and among them is a tree of life that has a different fruit. But every month it says it has a different fruit. That's amazing too. So it's a glorious scene of the, the abundance and the, the beauty and the prolificness all flowing from God and the Lamb. All, that's the inception. That's the start where it goes out from. Okay, while you're thinking on that, Rowena? Yeah, so with all the verses that you mentioned, it seems like the tree of life was at the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and then was moved to the, the, the good side of Sion, which is the paradise, and then finally right there before the throne of God. Okay, you just summed it all up and you did it perfectly for me. I hadn't brought out the point that you caught and you, you followed it well. It did apparently go into the heart of the earth in the paradise site of Sheol first, and we'll read verses that refer to that. And then we do see it in heaven now, the same way that we know paradise has been emptied out. To so say it again. Okay, the tree of life started in the Garden of Eden, right. to, to our knowledge, right. where we see it. Then, at some point, apparently it went into the heart of the earth, into the paradise side. No, no, it was brought down into the heart of the earth. Okay. And it's, it's where the people went who believed in the coming of Messiah before he had um, come onto earth. Okay, so they're looking forward to the cross. 
They went into the paradise side. They didn't go into a suffering. They went into a paradise side. And in that, we're going to see in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, we're going to see that the trees, that there were trees there. And it seems to be that the tree of life was one of them. Then when paradise is emptied out, apparently the Lord didn't just empty it out of the people, but he took at least the tree of life to heaven also, because the next thing we know is we're reading about the tree of life in heaven. In and heaven. then we see it in God's mm -hmm. eternal heaven. We see it that for all of eternity, the tree of life is there, making heaven beautiful, feeding us. But paradise is Abraham's bosom? That's what it was called yeah. in that, par in that yeah. story, not parable in that story, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like we'll say, um, what, you know, we sometimes have several different names for something. I can't think. I'm trying to come up with an example. Um, it is interesting that in my Hebrew thinking, the Jewish background, but this is the Jewish unsaved. This is not the one that, that believes in Messiah and salvation, heaven versus hell and all that, but they hope to go to heaven based on their good works. And the way that they call heaven, they call it Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Oh, that's isn't that their something? yeah, that's their their way of thinking. You know, just interesting that that's you know what they have. Um, did I hear somebody try to say something? Uh, Julie, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I know that um, the altar, the or uh, there there's a copy of. The altar and the, the mercy seat. The whole tabernacle, yes. Uh, yeah, the tabernacle, they're, they're God's tabernacle, but then there was the copy of the tabernacle on earth. Right. Is the tree of life maybe the same thing, or do you think this is literally one tree? I think it's that literal. That has moved from place to place. I think it's literal because God didn't ever say this is like what I have in heaven. We don't have that given where he made it clear through Moshe, build on earth what I showed you, pattern it after what you saw in the heavens. So I think I think it's literal. I think that God did literally plant the tree of life in the Garden of Eden for um, his creation to enjoy. When sin entered in and caused the problem, the consequences, you know, we move on. We're going to see, let me show you real quick, because we're going to run out of time. Let me show you where I see it in the heart of the earth, Ezekiel. which would be, yes, which would be paradise. But then we know the rest, that it, at some point it's taken into heaven, where God is now. Go with me real quick to Ezekiel 31, Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel 31, and, and by the way, come back next week. I'm going to do a comparison between two trees, okay? It's not the tree of life. I'll give you that much. You have no last next week. Is next week already? Where right. are we? We're on the 16th. No, next week yeah. is the 23rd. Right. GOC. GOC is the next week. The next week. Two weeks. Ezekiel 31. Stay tuned for the announcement about classes. Let me get my thought out here and finish it. And if you get cut off, if you have to leave, text me and I'll let you know. Ezekiel 31 verse 9. I made it beautiful with a multitude of branches and all the trees of Eden, which were in the garden of God, were jealous of it. Okay? So here you have the trees in the garden of Eden being mentioned. Drop down to verse 16. Verse 16 says, I made the nations quake at the sound of its fall when I made it go down to Sheol with those who go down to the pit and all the well-watered trees of Eden, the choicest and best of Lebanon were comforted in the earth beneath. So it sounds like there's some time when there was some sort of cataclysmic event where the trees went from on earth into the heart of the earth. 18 verse, the start of verse 18. To which among the trees of Eden are you thus equal in glory and greatness? And then it goes on, you'll be brought down to the trees of Eden to the earth beneath. That's talking about when they die. So it looks from these verses like there is a time when the trees that were on earth, and I'm not saying all the trees, but the trees in the garden, sounds like they were brought down into Sheol, into the heart of the earth, in that paradise side, and then later, at least the tree of life is brought into heaven. Maybe all the trees from the garden are in heaven. Because heaven's huge. Don't, don't limit its size. It's huge. 
and you're not going to live cramped. <laughs> you're going to live in, in spacious beauty. It's an interesting thought. We can pick it back up. We can pick it back up because I do have a little more to give you in between, and then I'm going to give you the comparison between two trees, which I find very interesting. Um, Julie. In Ezekiel 31, you started what verse? Verse 9, and then I read verse 16, and the first part at 18. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, and I'll bring that back up. I'll bring what happened to the Garden of Eden. I'll bring uh, it where I show you the same name being called Paradise. Um, that, and that was before the resurrection of Yeshua. And I'll show you the change. I'll take you through that. I'll take you through the change, how we get paradise from the heart of the earth into heaven now. Because there has to be a time when there was a change. And I'll bring you from scripture how I see that that, that took place. Okay? Some of you have heard that from me before. Hopefully you won't mind going through it again because I think it's important. You know, so um, we can follow and understand. And that will clear up some confusion that people have on some verses where you get all these missed teachings that, that Yeshua Jesus went to hell and suffered for three days. No, he didn't. He told the thief on the cross, you'll be with me in paradise. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Not three days later, you know, none of that. There's mm -hmm. um, the teaching that Jesus went down and preached to those who were already in hell, gave them a second chance. We'll show how that's not the right understanding of those verses. So there's a lot there that we'll bring in as we continue on in the next few verses of Genesis. So it should be a very interesting class on the trees and on the change of paradise where it is and knocking out some of these bad teachings that are not scripturally found. We'll show you from scripture why this is what we can believe, what we can know, you know to be true, because God gives it to us in his word. So on the basis of, of what I'm saying, I am very glad that we will have class next week. I don't want you to be confused. Next week is the 23rd. We will have class on the 23rd. It's the following week that GOC is where we do not have GOC's um, Global Outreach Conference or it's something similar as a missions conference of Emmanuel Baptist that um, we're involved in. Um, you are welcome instead of class to come to Emmanuel Baptist that Wednesday evening and wow. see the the booths. So you can G come GOC would be on the 30th, not yes. on the 23rd? Right. It's 20 the 27th 30th. through the 30th. 23rd is the other class. Say it again. Rochelle, say it again. It will be on? 27th. You know what? Let me call up my Gmail and make sure I'm not making a mistake. <laughs> I also because see Pastor Gilson. Because in Emmanuel is starting March 20 to 27, and the midweek of that is the 23rd okay. Wednesday. And I think I'm going to stand corrected. I think you're absolutely right, and I am going to have to remind us... Um, because BSM2 has no class next week. Yes. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm sure and you're right. Reason why. Yeah. I'm sure you're right, and I'm sure I'm the one that went rogue here all of a sudden. Pastor Gil and I went through this last night, forgive me, because we went through the whole, I know that's why I said he can speak up too, because we went through the Is whole schedule for when we're supposed to be um, on. You know, oh, there our he parts. Is. Here we go. Okay, so. And here we go. Okay, March 27th, Sunday, is the end of it. So, Rowena, absolutely right. Thank you for keeping me on track. March 23rd <laughs> is our booth. It is when I'm just so losing track of time right now. Next Wednesday, please don't come to class, <laughs> okay? I apologize for any confusion. Um, March 23rd, Wednesday, come to Mania Baptist at 6 p.m., <sighs> Yeah, at 6 p.m. they have their service and they'll introduce the missions, everything that's going on. By 7.30, you've gone to the other building upstairs. My gals and Tony have been working very hard to make <laughs> our booth beautiful. So come see our booth, come see all the booths for the missionaries, talk to the missionaries, get to know them, know how to pray for them, how to support them, all of that. That's Wednesday, March 23rd. Then they have other things going on between Wednesday and Sunday. Sunday night, we will also have the booths. That, again, is about the same time. Um, 
I'm looking for the time they start. 5.30 Sunday night, it starts in the sanctuary, and then you go to the booths again. So Wednesday the 23rd, Sunday the 27th are the two times that you can see the booth, okay? We are highly involved in that missions conference, so forgive me. My apologies. It's coming so fast here, I thought I had a whole other week. I just lost. <laughs> Next week, no class. Come to Mount Baptist Wednesday evening. The following week then, March 30th, I'll bring up the trees. I'll remind us where we stopped because I know two weeks from now we're not going to remember as well. I'll bring us the, the trees and these other things that I mentioned. So, sorry folks. <laughs> I'm beginning to mix up my days and my nights. So. Rowena, thank you. I really appreciate you making sure I did it right and got it clear to everybody. Um, yeah, because I was inviting my uh, BSF class to come and see our booths for all the missionaries. <laughs> and, they show up and, <laughs> and you were kind of worried, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so you're not gonna you're not going to have class on. Right, because you and I and Francis have to report at like 3.15 to where we go because we're part of the missionaries. So I can't have class because I couldn't get done with class and get ready and get everything out there. And my gals and Tony and Roger, oh yeah, i got to include Roger. Poor Roger. He's been involved just as much. Sorry, Roger. I guess you're one of the girls. <laughs> um, they, they will continue... <laughs> Don't kill him. Yes, no, no, we need him. So they'll all be building the booth there, you know, putting it up, putting the display up while Pastor Gill and I have to go report to where the missionaries report. So yes, there is no class next Wednesday because there's no way unless I can learn how to split myself in two. And then you all would have to do the same thing so you could be at both places. I think you should just do Zoom from the GOC. No, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> just come see me in person. Just come see me in person. We'll make up for not having class there. It'll just be a different type of class. So what time is it starting in the church at, on the 23rd? On the 23rd on Wednesday, it starts at 6. I'm looking real quick. Yes, 6 o'clock. Is, is, um, is, yeah. is it in the IBC? Is it in the IBC? Calendar, yeah. In the, in the app? Yes, it should be. Okay, I got that. It should be. And if you have any questions, there are plenty of us who know to call now. I'll call um, Rowena. Rowena knows. She's on. <laughs> she gets an A+. Plus. Do you all see the sin comes right down to me today? I am not perfect, folks. <laughs> I am so thankful for my salvation. And I'm so thankful oh. the Lord gives me people who are such a support and a help who are keeping me on the right track. Again, my thank you, you to know, Michelle, you. Michelle, actually, me. I am just surprised because it's bearing 12 types of fruits. Why will Eve still want to taste another fruit? It's just like, oh. We love variety. Look at the variety God's given us. He doesn't give us one type of flower. He gives us a million It's going to have mango flowers. and papaya. It's better oh, than that. wonderful. <laughs> and figs. Yeah, but the thing is, Eve still looked at another tree. Why? Oh, why did she need to? I understand your question now. Why did she need to? I agree. It was not out of a lack. It was not out of boring. She had all kinds of variety, and not only that tree, but so many other trees. No, no, it was the deceptiveness of the serpent that got into her and got her to look at something and think, oh, that's beautiful, when it was as rotten to the core as it could be. Yeah. And uh, and then what would you do? Isn't it because for her to be more knowledgeable? That's that's See, what we're reading. You would have fallen too, nor more knowledgeable. <laughs> yes, Roger. You started with three sixteen today, right? Yes. Did you know what today is? Three sixteen, and I did say that. And class sixteen. I didn't say three, but oh, wow. and it's class sixteen. So we have on the calendar three sixteen. We started with Genesis 3, 16, oh, and in Genesis, this is our class number 16. <laughs> <laughs> and 16 means love. 16 means love? Yes. Hebrew, uh -huh. you know, because it's a thing that means love. Okay, okay, I'll believe what it. What did she say, Hebrew 16? 16? No, just 16, number 16 means stands love. for love in, in the Hebrew, she said. Yeah. Oh, I know 18 is life. 
So 16 is luck. Interesting. Uh -huh. Okay. Maria, wow. are you still listening? Are you still there, yes, Maria? I am. Yes. Okay. Uh, are you? Will you be able to come on Saturday? You know, I have a, 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 a um in Rialto, so I will have to backtrack again and then from there I'm going to go to Castaic, so I'm most likely I don't think I will be able to. Uh -huh, uh -huh. With the price of gas, oh, we okay. can understand that, let alone the wear and tear on the body. <laughs> let me yes. close in That's prayer. Okay. Let me close in prayer real quick so those who want to go can. Okay. Um, what they're talking about, again, I remind you, everyone's invited to our Purim celebration. It is with our Shabbat service on Saturday at Pastor Gill's in Ukaipa. We'll start at 9.30, um, just like we usually do here, but we'll be there. Don't count on it being able to be Zoomed. I don't know, it depends on whether we're indoor or outdoor, what Roger can do or not do. So I'm not, you know, he'll do whatever he can, but better to be there in person. If we can Zoom, we will. <coughs> For the sake of those who can't make it, but uh, where you can carpool from here, just I need to know so that I arrange it. Um, but everybody's invited. So we've got Purim this Saturday. We will follow it by uh, being at Emmanuel Baptist on Wednesday for the booths and the following Sunday for the booths. Then by the end of the month, the last day of the month, the 30th, come back to class as usual today. Okay? All right. Um, Julie, a question? Um, actually, a, a prayer request. Okay. Um, have I let you all know that my son's friend, Preston, committed suicide? Yes. Okay, so his service will be um, on the 5th and 6th of April. Okay. okay. Um, so just keep, I'm not sure what what beliefs the family right. held. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I have every intention of going, um, so... Is it out of state? It's up north. North, okay. Uh, Modesto okay. area. Okay. Uh, the family's really been through it the last couple of years. Um, the the uh, fires went through, and their house was actually saved. The, the ranch, the barn, and the, and the house were actually saved. But then it rained really hard that following winter and flooded everything out. There was literally several feet of mud in the house, so they had to rebuild somewhere else. Um, and now this with Creston. So wow. um, they've been through a I, lot, like you say. They, yeah, they've been through a lot, and I, I, I know Creston because of Daniel, but I haven't really had the chance to meet the family yet. Okay. So um, I'm just upholding them in prayer because I don't know. I know he had um, three brothers and three sisters or two sisters or something. There were several kids, several siblings, um, but I, I'm not sure what their beliefs were. Okay. Well, let's close in prayer and pray for them. We have been praying, but I did not in opening prayer. I didn't remember. Yeah. Again, I apologize. I, I, you can all pray for my rememberer. <laughs> that's called COVID brain, sweetie. Oh, I'll take that excuse. <laughs> uh, that, that's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. I use this many months later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use a pre and post, too. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's close in prayer. Our precious Messiah and Savior, we thank you for showing us your great love, your sacrifice of yourself for us that we might live eternally with you. Our hearts just swell up with appreciation and thankfulness, and those words just fall so short of what we really want to convey. Thank you, Lord, that you know our heart and you know the meaning behind these words and how thankful we are that you planned redemption for Adam and Eve and for all who come from Adam and Eve, that you gave us this, this gift freely. And Lord, thank you for each one among us who has come to believe. We pray for any who hear this who have not, that they'll come to know you in that personal way as Savior also. Lord, we thank you for the glories of heaven that will be ours forever for those of us who have put our faith in you and applied your blood on that mercy seat in our place for the, the forgiveness of our sins. Oh, Lord. You've done it all. You've covered us. You have given us your robe of righteousness, and you bring us home. And we praise and we thank you for it forever. Lord, while we are still here, we pray we'll be able to share that with many others, and especially at a time like this with Preston's family. 
Lord, we don't know where they are, whether they have the hope of eternal life with you or whether they don't know where, where their future, what it holds and where they will be. We pray that as Julie and any others like her who have the answers to life, go up to spend this critical time with the family, to go through the service time with them, that they'll have opportunity to be able to share your love with any who need to hear it, with any who are not of that saved position in you. And we pray that through this, through his death, there might be many who would come to eternal life with you forever one day. Lord, we pray for any who do know you, that the comfort that only you can give in the midst of such hard circumstances, that you would give that grace, that comfort, that you would enable them to carry on and to go on because uh, you are able to give us all we need and even when we think we can't hang on ourselves, Lord, you carry us. So we thank you that you are the answer, that you are life and you are the way to live life now and how we just pray that uh, this family can be ministered to at this time, either come to know it or, or be reassured and strengthened in it. But we pray also for the friends and, and all who will come, those who knew Preston in different ways. Lord, may it be that they would hear these words of life and carry that back to their sphere of influence, that in this way many, many might come to saving knowledge of you, that you are the answer, that you, you are all we need, Lord, is you, and you are everything. We thank you and praise you for that. As we look to the conference that will be coming, we pray that people will realize, those who are believers, the importance of uh, standing with the missionaries who are trying to spread this good news throughout the world. We pray that uh, as we share and show our corner of the world being to the Jewish people, wherever they've been scattered, that people would catch vision for this and not ignore um, reaching out in that that great commission to the nation of Israel and to the Jewish people wherever they're found because they too need to hear these words of saving grace. So Lord, we pray that you'll use this time greatly. We pray that everyone will be enriched by uh, their time involvement with helping uh, missionaries in whatever way that takes position. And then Lord, we thank you that we can look forward to coming back together again to study your word. Thank you that every answer to every question of life is in your word. Thank you that you've shown it to us, that you've given us this gift. May we remember to open your love letter constantly, to read it and glean from it all that we need because you are faithful to show us in your word whatever the question we have is answered, whatever need is met. Lord, you are awesome and amazing. Your name is lifted up high above and you are deserving of all our praise. To you be glory forever and ever in your holy name. And, and Lord, I pray, go with all, be with them, meet every need as only you can, and may they have joy even in the midst of their suffering because of you. Thank you. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen.